Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody. So, today we are here to discuss bioavailability and bioequivalence. We must have had the preliminary lectures we must have attended on pharmacokinetics, some of the pharmacokinetic principles we are already acquainted with. Now, in fact, the concept of bioavailability and bioequivalence is an extension of the pharmacokinetic concepts. We will try to understand this and how this relates to pharmacotherapy. First, let us have a plan what we are going to talk today. First, we try, will try to understand why understanding bioequivalence is important for us as medical students. We are going to be doctors after a few years and we will be writing medicines, prescribing medicines. Now, while prescribing medicines for our patients, why it is important to have an understanding of bioavailability of the medicines that we prescribe. Second, we will be also today try to understand how we can define bioavailability, what is bioavailability actually and there are terms like absolute and relative bioavailability, what do we mean by them, how are they different, what are the different factors that can influence bioavailability when you attended the lecture on pharmacokinetics, you must have also considered issues like factors that influence absorption. Absorption is one of the important pharmacokinetic process. The other ph pharmacokinetic processes being distribution, metabolism or biotransformation and then excretion. So, these are the four pharmacokinetic processes as you have read already understood already A, D, A, M, E they are called absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion. In a word I can say that when you talk of bioavailability, you actually take cognizance of actually you consider all these pharmacokinetic processes or in other words the summative effect of all these pharmacokinetic processes. So, that how the drug that you prescribe, how the drug that you administer when you are expecting it's, it is, it would produce some desired benefit, how it is doing this? From the point of administration up to the point when it is causing some desired benefit or sometimes some of the undesired effects, how it is causing, how the drug molecule is reaching out there in the different parts of the body including the target organ or the target tissue, target site and the several millions of non-target sites as a result of which you are ultimately getting the desired benefit or the unwanted effects. All in order to understand all this, we need to understand how the drug molecule is moving in our system and reaching in the target tissue and what are the hurdles it has to cross through. Bioavailability or understanding of bioavailability will help us to appreciate this. So, we will understand the factors that can influence bioavailability that is important to know because while prescribing we have to keep this in mind. So, that we can optimize the effects of the drugs particularly the desired benefits of the drug of the medicines that you prescribe. We will also try to understand broadly in principle how to measure bioavailability and then there is another concept and that is bioequivalence which is also an extension of bioavailability a type of bioavailability rather and what is bioequivalence and why it is important to do bioequivalence study. Although as doctors we are not going to do bioequivalence studies, but the medicines that we prescribe many of such medicines particularly if you can remember the term generic medicines before they come in the market they have to pass through this bioequivalence studies. We will discuss a little bit about them also and finally, we will be summarized. Now, first why it is important to understand bioavailability. 
we know that whenever we are using a drug we have a definite purpose there is a defined goal when when we are using drugs now in order to achieve this goal you have to administer the medicine as doctor we are prescribing when we are prescribing we are expecting the patient will comply with our advice the medicine will be procured or the medicine will be dispensed and finally the medicine will be taken or it will be administered depending on the dosage form or the formulation that you use you can give a tablet oral tablet that is taken orally you can give a injection it could be an intramuscular injection it could be an intravenous injection and then after you administer the drug after the drug reaches the system it will try to do what you are expecting it do it to do and sometimes it will also do something which you are not liking that is the adverse effects the scientific basis of prescribing then relies heavily on the understanding of these phenomena so you start with a dosage form or a formulation that the medicine that you are prescribing that has to be available in a given form whether it is a tablet or a capsule or an injection and all this is in the area of pharmacology that deals with this is called pharmaceutics the form form or the dosage form or the formulation that is available which is actually procured dispensed administered and these forms have lot of bearing on how the drug will move in our system when we take this orally or when we inject this and that movement of the medicine or movement of the drug molecules in our system that is what is called pharmacokinetics we have already read this and the different pharmacokinetic processes also we are familiar with absorption absorption mainly is considered when you are taking the medicine orally when we swallow a medicine absorption can also take place when you are applying it say on the skin but more prominently when you are taking the medicine orally most of the time there are a few exceptions when even when you are taking orally you are actually expecting a local action but then mostly when you are taking medicines orally we are expecting a systemic action that means in order to produce the effect the medicine needs to get into the system that means it will not remain limited within the gastrointestinal tract it will pass through the hurdle of the gastrointestinal wall gastrointestinal epithelium and go to the other side in the circulation and that's what is absorption that we have already read now after it is absorbed it gets into the circulation but it cannot it does not really get directly into the circulation systemic circulation it has to pass through it primarily it reaches this portal circulation and the portal circulation will take it to the liver it has to pass through the hurdle of the liver why i am saying the hurdle because liver is there as a sentry in or liver is actually protecting us from any external substances so that we cannot get damaged by the external substances although when we are giving drugs drugs are also external substances but then liver cannot discriminate between a drug or a poison liver otherwise houses innumerable number of enzymes the enzymes are there to actually metabolize or detoxify whatever external substances we are taking and that's why i am saying it is a hurdle the drug molecules have to cross this hurdle of the liver or rather in other words the hepatic enzymes the liver enzymes the different liver enzymes depending on the nature of the drug will act on the drug and will try to chemically transform it because it is in the bio system that's why it is called biotransformation after it is biotransformed or it is metabolized the amount of drug that was taken certain portion will not be then available post liver or after you cross the hurdle of liver so little bit of it will be destroyed there by the enzymes so some part because it has been lost so the rest portion will only be available in the systemic circulation so that will go to the heart right heart left heart general circulation to the target tissue and also millions of non target tissues that's how it works and this all this is kinetics and all this is happening in a in a in a continuous dynamics setting that means that as it comes to the central circulation 
a portion of it as it gets distributed in the different tissues and depending on the nature of the drug, nature of the medicine, it will have predilection or preference towards certain tissues and get, get more attached for a longer period of time in those tissues. So, this is what is known as distribution in different tissues and then again it comes back to the central circulation. And then as it is going to different tissues, it also goes to the kidney and kidney is there to eliminate out, excrete out. Now, what you get finally in the central circulation is the resultant effect, summative effect of all these forces. Somebody is trying to limit when it is entering the central circulation that is that liver. Somebody is trying to get push it to other tissues distribution. There are other forces that is trying to throw it out from the system that is the kidney, the renal, renal excretion and finally, whatever is available in the central circulation that is what is availability in the biosystem or bioavailability. And only that what is bioavailable is available for producing any effect at the target site and unfortunately, will also be available for producing unwanted effects. So, the desired benefit or the harmful effects or are because of the bioavailability of the drug and this handling of undesired effects, unwelcome effects and optimization of beneficial effects is all pharmacotherapeutics is all about. So, therefore, the understanding of bioavailability will help us to appreciate the steps that are followed from pharmaceutics to pharmacokinetics to pharmacodynamics to pharmacotherapeutics. Although our primary interest is in pharmacotherapeutics, in order to have it properly happening we need to also understand the prior steps of pharmaceutics, kinetics and dynamics. So, summarily to produce the desired benefit the drug must reach the target site in adequate quantity. Now, this adequate quantity is important okay. and in order to have the drug molecules reaching out at the target site in adequate quantity, we have to decide how much would be the primary dosing and what should be the route of administration, what is its bioavailability characteristics, whether it, it part of it or, or substantial portion of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the dose that is given orally that is being lost while it, during its passage through the liver. So, that is what is otherwise known as first pass effect during its first passage through the, through the liver. So, all these factors will actually determine how much will be ultimately available for producing its pharmacological effects. So, that is what is bioavailability all about. So, then if we try to define bioavailability like this, it is basically the extent and the rate to which the administered drug reaches the systemic circulation and hence the target site. Here is a amount of assumption, we are assuming that anything that reaches systemic circulation will reach the target site. So, I repeat the extent and rate to which the administered drug reaches the systemic circulation and hence the target site in an unchanged form to produce the therapeutic response is known as bioavailability. Now, this in an unchanged form is important, but then there is some exception. There are certain drugs which are not given in the active form. So, it is given in the inactive form and we are expecting it to be modified to an active form during its passage through the liver and then the active form is what is reaching the systemic circulation. So, that can also happen, but otherwise in general we say that in unchanged form when it is reaching the systemic circulation that is bioavailability. Okay. I think we have understood what it is, why we are mentioning about both extent and rate we will discuss again. So, if I take a, a a medicine say it contains say 1000 molecules and then when I swallow it, when I take it orally out of the 1000 molecules, how many molecules are reaching in the central circulation. If say for instance out of 1000 molecules only 600 molecules reach the systemic circulation and the rest for 400 molecules they are lost during its passage through the liver or even before that when we are swallowing it, it is not really getting absorbed 
it is not even before it, it gets absorbed not necessarily if we take 1000 molecules not all the 1000 molecules will be able to cross the intestinal lumen or the intestinal epithelium that is in the absorption process itself 40 percent of it is lost. Then again when it passes through the liver portal circulation and through the liver then again say another 20 percent is lost. So, then what is left is 40 percent. So, 40 percent is reaching the systemic circulation. Okay. Now, this 40 percent then is the bioavailability of the drug. So, 1000 molecule now 400 molecules only is reaching the systemic circuit that is the extent of availability. Now, rate is also important why because in therapy we also need the time or the promptness with which the drug will be reaching the systemic circulation. When we are doing a chronic dosing repeated dosing then of course, the rate becomes the rate at which it, it is reaching it is otherwise uh, taken care of, but other if in situations where you are where, where the treatment only requires a single acute dosing then the rate is important because that will also determine the promptness with which you can expect the benefits to happen. Let us move on. Now, this is absolute versus relative bioavailability concept. Absolute bioavailability it is not difficult at all this is basically whenever you talk of bioavailability you are actually comparing. So, absolute bioavailability is the amount of drug from a formulation that reaches the systemic circulation relative to an intravenous dose. That means, when I am giving a drug giving a medicine by intravenous route I am directly reaching into the central circulation. So, there is nothing can be lost in the process of its administration in the process of prior to its absorption or immediate after its absorption as it passes through the liver because all these steps are bypassed and you are directly reaching out to the systemic circulation by giving an intravenous injection. Then the bioavailability when you are giving intravenous injection of any drug would be 100 percent. So, the total amount of dose that is given it is instantly reaching the systemic circulation that is what is 100 percent bioavailability. So, but then when you are giving a medicine by oral route or any non intravenous route even when you are giving it by say uh, intramuscular injection when you are giving it by subcutaneous injection. So, it will take time it will take time to get into the systemic circulation and not necessarily all the amount will be reaching to the systemic circulation certain portion will be lost in the process of transfer from the, the, the point where you have administered up to the systemic circulation. So, there when you try to measure absolute bioavailability of the drug that is basically comparison of bioavailability by a non intravenous route compared to the bioavailability of intravenous route that means 100 against 100 percent. So, how much percent of the administered dose is actually reaching that what is called absolute bioavailability. I read the definition again it is the amount of drug from a formulation that reaches the systemic circulation relative to an intravenous dose that means relative to the total dose that is being administered. The intravenous dose is assumed to be 100 percent bioavailable as we discussed since you are injecting the drug directly into the systemic circulation. Now, coming to the concept of relative bioavailability. Now, it is interesting to note in the definition of absolute bioavailability there also the definition itself says relative to an intravenous dose, but here relative bioavailability here it is actually you are comparing the bioavailability in two different formulations. Okay non-IV formulations two different oral formulations one is a reference formulation and the other is the test formulation. Okay. So, two different formulation the same dose strength and then same dose has been given, but one how much is available with the first as compared to the second. So, that is the what is relative bioavailability it is commonly used when an IV formulation does not exist or cannot be made. So, then we call it a relative bioavailability we will consider this concept of relative viability again when we will discuss bioequivalence. 
Now, absolute bioavailability then is the fraction of the administered dose when given by any route other than intravenous route compared with that of intravenous administration. The comparison must be dose normalized namely account for different dosage or varying weights of the subjects. Consequently, the amount absorbed is corrected by dividing the corresponding dose administered. How we will be discussing? So, there is a question of dose correction or dose adjustment okay, when you are actually giving different doses okay, of injectable versus say oral. So, then you have to do some kind of dose correction also. Now, absolute bioavailability then compares the bioavailability of the active drug following non IV administration with the bioavailability of the same drug following IV administration. So, it is the fraction of the drug entering the system through non IV administration compared with that of IV administration. So, it is area under the curve non IV divided by area under the curve IV. Now, this becomes a new term area under the curve what curve you are talking about. If you have already uh, gone through the lecture on uh, other pharmacokinetics uh, otherwise area under the curve means here we are actually meaning area under the time concentration curve that means along x axis it is time and along y axis it is the concentration. If you, if you undertake an experiment where a subject is an individual is administered a given dose and then relative to the timing of the dosing of a medicine at different time points you collect blood sample and then measure how much drug is available in that blood sample of that particular time. So, at 0 hour just when you are you have just given or just prior to the dosing just prior to dosing or immediately after the dosing when you are giving an oral dose and immediately if you take the blood sample you do not expect any drug to reach the systemic circulation at 0 hour. So, it will be 0 and then say after 15 minutes you take a sample after 30 minutes you take a sample after 60 minutes you take a sample after 2 hours following the administration you take a sample after 4 hours you take a sample 8 hours 16 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours. So, at so many time points relative to the timing of the administration of a single dose of an oral drug, if you take the samples and then measure the available the concentration of the drug in these samples, what kind of pattern you will get? Can you guess? 0 hour is of course, 0 and then gradually the concentration will build up up to a point and then because the availability of the drug in the central circulation as we have stated is the resultant effect of all the kinetic processes operating simultaneously. So, the drug getting absorbed from the intestine okay, following mostly the passive diffusion concentration dependent passive diffusion along the gradient okay. then there is absorbs the the biotransformation in the liver maybe the drug has a fast pass effect so major portion or considerable portion of the drug proportion of the administered dose may be lost during its fast passage through the through the liver then the drug gets distributed and the drug gets excreted and as time passes by as more amount of drug gets accumulated in the in the central compartment the rate of elimination or the rate of distribution also increases and the rate of absorption will be gradually less and less because the amount that is available in the intestinal tract for absorption that also getting less and less. So, initially the absorption rate will be higher the distribution will be gradually building up and as we proceed the distribution will be more and more and elimination will be more as more more drug are accumulating in the central circulation 
and what you get then there will be a ascending curve because y axis is the concentration gradually increasing concentration x axis is time. So, you get an ascending part you get a peak and you get a descending curve the peak actually will determine at a point when the inflow and the outflow from the central circulation is same. So, there you get the peak and as the rate of inflow is less than the rate of outflow from the central pool there will be decline of the concentration. So, the declining curve. So, the ascending part the peak and the declining part. So, that forms a dome shaped curve and the area that is trapped under the curve is called the area under the time concentration curve. So, this will happen this dome will happen in case of an oral administration single dose oral administration, but when you are giving it IV what kind of what kind of what would be the shape of the area under the curve it will not be a dome really it will be when you are giving it intravenously at 0 hour the peak will be reached and then from that point it will be declining gradually. So, the ascending limb of the curve is missing here actually the ascending limb is represented by the y axis here. I will show you a diagram where it will be clear we can better understand with the diagram. Now, we will come back to this slide let us go to the next part. Now, having said this this much let us now consider the next part that is the factors that can influence bioavailability. So, broadly speaking we can consider three broad types of factors one is some of the factors which are inherent in the drug itself the drug factors depending on what is the formulation we are considering what is the dosage form whether it is a tablet whether it is a capsule whether it is a it is a elixir or liquid preparation for oral consumption whether it is an injection. So, depending on that <coughs> the the bioavailability will be different if it is an liquid preparation as compared to a oral dosage form a liquid dosage form will have better bioavailability because for a oral dosage form in order to get absorbed it has to be dissolved in the intestinal system with the in the intestinal juice it will get dissolved and depending on the on 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 the pharmaceutical characteristics or the manufacturing characteristics the drug may or may not dissolve easily ok that is what is called dissolution property dissolution and disintegration of oral dosage form. In case of capsule it needs to be released because the cover of the capsule outer cover of the capsule is inert and the and it has to be it has to it is meant for releasing the active drug which is trapped inside the capsule. But when you talk of a liquid oral preparation there is no question of dissolution or release or disintegration. So, it can directly the, the molecules drug molecules are otherwise directly available for absorption. So, naturally there will be faster absorption as compared to the uh, solid dosage form. So, accordingly then there will be more bioavailability chances of faster and more that means greater extent bioavailability is possible in case of a liquid dosage form route of administration is also important which route you are administering whether it is oral whether it is intravascular intravenous or it is intramuscular depending on this the bioavailability will be different. The excipients in the formulation and uh, depending on the nature of excipients are otherwise supposed to be inert substances, but sometimes they are not really that much inert and they can also affect the bioavailability they can they can uh, sometimes uh, increase the rate of absorption they can reduce the rate of absorption hinder absorption. So, and that is the reason why uh, the excipients are also important what excipient and if you are even sometimes when you are substituting one brand to another because the excipient might be different the uh, bioavailability of the drug might be different and similar kind of thing actually happened long back in one case where uh, an anti epileptic drug you know phenytoin is an anti epileptic drug and uh, a child was 
receiving phenytoin, he, his epilepsy was well under control. For whatever reasons, the doctor, concerned doctor changed or substituted the brand and when the brand substitution was undertaken, prescribed, suddenly it is found that the, the, the control of epilepsy is gone and the, and the child started having epileptic fits. And then it was found, although the dose was same, dose was not changed. So, it was the change in the excipient that was responsible for reducing the availability of the active ingredient and that is phenytoin sodium and as a result of which there was breakthrough seizure. So, excipients are also important to consider in, in bioavailability and how he, he, this is also an glaring example how understanding bioavailability or the concept of bioavailability is important for the prescribers also. The other physicochemical properties like solubility we have spoken about dissolution, the partition coefficient, the, the uh, polarity of the drug, the molecular weight, okay, all these bigger size of the molecule and the smaller size of the molecule all these will, will actually affect uh, bioavailability of a drug. Coming to the patient factors, uh, we all know the extremes of is a very young child, very old man, pregnancy by itself all these factors they can influence the bioavailability of a drug and uh, the anatomical and functional integrity of the absorptive surface. So, the ultimately particularly for oral medicines you have to get the medicine needs to be absorbed and for that absorptive surface is to be available. So, for whatever reasons if there is structural or a functional integrity of the absorptive surface is hampered. So, that will also affect the uh, compromise the bioavailability. Sometimes if there is a uh, the, the any comorbid condition that can affect the gastrointestinal motility, say somebody is suffering from diarrhea, somebody is suffering from vomiting. So, thereby the contact time of the molecule with the absorptive surface will be less in case of diarrhea. So, same is true with vomiting when uh, after you swallow the medicine itself is vomited out. So, you cannot expect the, it, it, uh, the, uh, the drug will, will get absorbed liver impairment, the, uh, the enzymes are lost, okay. the liver enzymes that are supposed to actually act as a sentry. So, if they are not there and sometimes they are the liver enzymes can also be uh, also be uh, <coughs> influenced or, or induced or stimulated or inhibited okay, by other drugs. So, that is also possible renal impairment because of renal compromise the drugs cannot be eliminated uh, promptly. So, they keep on accumulating. So, bioavailability will be increased. So, all these patient factors may be responsible for influencing bioavailability either increasing or decreasing. The other contextual factors like concomitant medications that what I was just discussing that simultaneously the patient is taking other medicines which impact on the kinetic behavior whether it is absorption or whether it is distribution, protein binding or the uh, enzyme activity in the liver. So, the excretion uh, through the kidney. So, and thereby the, the bioavailability will be absolute bioavailability will be affected. Uh, <coughs> many of the drug drug interactions and drug food interactions, drug drink in the many a times we say that take the medicine in empty stomach, take the medicine 2 hours after food or take the medicine, you can take the medicine along with food. There are certain foods we can, which can also stimulate uh, certain drugs. Milk can stimulate a drug called rhizofalvin that is used in the fungal infection of the skin. So, uh, these factors also concomitant medications, the intake of relative timing of intake of food, drinks and type of food also they can affect the absorption, the metabolism or even the excretion of, of drugs. So, now let us talk a little bit about fast pass effect which might have also been discussed earlier it could be kind of repetition, but then it is important to appreciate this again reiterate this. It is interesting to note that although this is basically a kinetic uh, pharmacokinetic concept fast pass effect, but then the term is effect. The reason possibly is because of this kinetic behavior or kinetic uh, variable kinetic uh, uh, factor ultimately it is impacting much on the pharmacodynamics. So, that is why it is called fast pass effect. This refers to the drug lost 
between the oral administration and the first appearance in the systemic circulation. So, that means after absorption when it passes through the uh, liver or even you can say after it is swallowed if it is lost in the gastrointestinal tract itself. Okay. So, there are some enzymes in the gastrointestinal tract which can also eliminate which can also metabolize drug or uh, uh, degrade the drugs by transform the drug. So, thereby the in the same form it is not reaching the systemic circulation. The drug must survive the milieu in the gastrointestinal tract cross the gut wall and then pass through the portal vein to the liver. If a drug molecule survives that uh, gauntlet it will reach the systemic circulation. Liver metabolism is the biggest challenge with increasing bioavailability. Increases in solubility and gut wall permeability will not significantly improve the bioavailability. If however, we could modify the drug molecule to avoid some liver metabolism, we might be able to increase bioavailability significantly. So, the first pass metabolism or the first pass effect is an important concept and which we must remember and there are certain drugs which have very high fast pass effect. So, long it is given by uh, in chronic dosing that is otherwise getting uh, neutralized, but for acute effect when you require a dramatic effect if a drug has a very high fast pass metabolism then possibly you have to think of bypassing this and think of some route whereby the first pass metabolism that happens because of the oral administration that can be bypassed and you can think of uh, faster uh, effect of the drug. Okay. And that is precisely done by say sometimes sublingual administration the nitrates that are given in angina pectoris which is a cardiac emergency when there is a chest pain and you put the nitrate under the tongue isorbide dinitrate under the tongue and this first pass metabolism is avoided because there is no portal circulation there directly the drug molecules get absorbed and gets into the systemic circulation and it can produce the benefit reaches the heart quickly and it can produce benefit quickly. But remember the same nitrate when you are the same nitrate is also taken orally through repeated dosing in order to prevent this uh, chest pain or the anginal pain or the anginal attack. So, the same drug given by sublingual administration in a, in order to in order to abort a coronary pain okay, ischemic pain is ischemic coronary pain and the same drug you are giving in repeated dosing in order to prevent prophylactic use. There you do not bother about first pass effect because even if it is lost then it will be made up by repeated administration and ultimately a steady state will be achieved so far as the drug concentration is concerned in the central circulation and thereby it will impact on the target of target site its availability in the target site. Now, coming to how to measure bioavailability truly speaking it is extremely difficult if not impossible to measure concentration available at the target site. We are primarily interested to have the drug available at the target site, but it is almost impossible to measure it at the target site. So, what we do we do a compromise, but then we have seen that it is it is fine that if we can measure it in the central circulation uh, the with the assumption that the availability in the plasma would well correlate availability in target site I think there is not much of a problem. Okay. So, it is for our convenience because of easy accessibility to the central circulation we actually collect blood and then do a venipuncture collect blood and measure its concentration of the drug. So, that is how it is done okay. measurement is done in plasma. So, bioavailability is usually assessed by determining the area under the plasma concentration time curve or rather more correctly time concentration curve x axis is time y axis is concentration and the most reliable measure of bioavailability is the area under the curve. And the area under the curve actually gives you an impression of the extent of bioavailability just remember the definition we had said the extent and rate of bio, rate of availability. So, area under the curve gives us a measure of the extent of of, of availability, but what about the rate? if we do not also measure if we do not also have uh, our eye on some other parameters which gives us the the some idea about the rate of uh, of of 
availability at what rate it is reaching the target site. So, possibly we will not be doing justice particularly in bioequivalent studies we will be discussing that. The other measures therefore, are C max the maximum concentration that is achieved C for concentration max maximum maximum concentration that can be achieved after a single administration and T max is the time by which the maximum concentration is achieved that is T max half life T half the T half absorption or T half elimination the time it takes for elimination of half the concentration okay, by which half the concentration is remaining. So, that is elimination half life. There similarly, the concept can be applied in absorption also. We can also have absorption half life. Absorption half life is the time during which half of a administered dose is absorbed okay, that is absorption half life. Now, this is a cartoon which shows the pattern of uh, bioavailability of same drug when it is given equivalent doses have been given in oral administration and through intravenous administration. The blue one is oral administration and the red one is intravenous administration as we had stated that uh, earlier that you see here the oral administration one it is a dome shaped gradually rising gradually rising reaching a peak and then declining. The rise is steeper than the decline this rise is because of in this phase up to this point the rate of absorption is higher than the rate of distribution or rate of metabolic destruction or the rate of excretion. So, when this is happening that does not mean that the other three processes it is only absorption. So, the other three processes are also happening that means, the distribution metabolism and excretion is also happening, but the rate at which the drug molecules are entering into the circulation is much more than the rate at which the drug molecules are leaving the central circulation that is why you are building concentration gradually building concentration. At this point probably the rate of building concentration and the rate of losing concentration is the same and that is why you, you have reached a peak and then it is no longer increasing it has the increase has come to a halt and then it starts declining that means, from this point on the rate of absorption is less or the extent of absorption is less compared to the extent to which it is leaving the central circulation. The mechanisms for leaving is the metabolic degradation, the distribution to other compartments or other tissues and also elimination or rather the excretion by the kidney or other, other uh, organs. So, this is excretion. Again if you compare this decline phase in the initial phase distribution is more active and the in the later phase it is the excretion that is more active okay. and ultimately you get a dome shaped curve like this and this area that is trapped under this curve is called time concentration curve this part is concentration C concentration time concentration curve okay. and this curve has been made possible by taking samples say 15 minutes half an hour okay, like that. So, this is 0 hour, this is 4 hour, this is 8 hour like that. So, 15 minutes, half an hour, 1 hour. So, this is one point, this is another point, this is another point, point of concentration at different points, point time point concentration has been measured, they have been put here and then they have been joined by a line whereby this curve has been obtained. And so, this gives you an idea of the area under the curve that is the extent of bioavailability. Similarly, here you have given intravenous injection. So, at 0 hour you get the maximum concentration and if that has been taken as say 100, 100 units arbitrary units. So, that is maximum and then gradually it will decline because there is no question of any absorption here. So, directly you have been put into the central circulation. Now, it is getting distributed, it is getting metabolized, it is getting 
excreted. So, gradually it is coming down. Okay. So, here also the area under the curve is there and you can measure this area under the curve. Okay. And there are ways of how to measure this area under the curve, there are different formula. The broadly it can be said that this can be divided into uh, different trapezoids. So, if you can draw a line from here, if you can draw another line from here. So, this is a rectangle which is called a trapezoid. Similarly, the next also this point and this point you draw a line perpendicular to y axis to meet the x axis and the line here. So, this becomes another trapezoid. So, the area of the trapezoid there is formula by which we can find out and then you add the areas of these many trapezoids many trapezoids. So, that is how you can calculate one can calculate the area under the curve. Okay. Now, now coming to bioequivalence this is another concept bioequivalence is actually a relative bioavailability concept we had discussed about relative bioavailability earlier. So, absolute bioavailability we have said that bioavailability by any non intravenous route bioavailability of a drug relative to bioavailability when it is given by intravenous route. Considering bioavailability of intravenous route is 100 percent. So, what is the relative to that what is the bioavailability when you are giving it by non intravenous route mostly it is oral route. Here when you talk of relative bioavailability you are actually comparing the bioavailability of either the same drug given by different routes or same drug given by the same route okay, same dosage form or different dosage form. So, it refers to the absence of here you see interestingly the definition is a negative definition refers to the absence of a significant difference in the bioavailability of the active ingredient in pharmaceutical equivalents or pharmaceutical alternatives when administered at the same dose. So, two tablets one is a reference tablet the other is a test tablet. Now, compared to the reference tablet if the reference tablet is considered as 100 percent bioavailability. So, compared to that what is the bioavailability of the test whether it is as good as say as good as the reference that is if it is 100 it is also 100 or the possibility is the test the bioavailability of the test drug or the test formulation both are say 500 milligram tablets, but the bioavailability of the test formulation is only 90 percent as compared to considering that as 100 percent reference drug or it could be instead of 90 percent it is 110 percent. So, it is different, but next the question is whether it is significant difference. Now, so long it is 90 or 110 it is considered to be non significant. Okay. So, for the regulatory purpose when you, you might have heard the term of when a drug for the first time comes in the market very new drug that is what is called a innovator drug for the first time ever in the whole of the world a company has brought a drug in the market. So, that becomes an innovator drugs and that is a patented molecule that means the company has the monopoly to maximize its profit up to a certain period of time that is patent period that is for drugs it is 20 years from the day of patent grant the company e for a period of 20 years the company can maximize its profit, but unfortunately so far as drugs are concerned in order to get the drug in the market it takes about 10 to 12 years. So, most of the time the company has 6 to 8 years left for maximizing profit and during this 20 years or in this case the 6 to 8 years no other company can market the same drug that is as per the patent law or patent rules, but after that patent period expires the monopoly of profiteering expires and then the regulatory authority can allow companies to, to make copies of the innovator drug and they are called generic medicines generic drug, but then one condition is there the generic drug must be a true copy of the ori originator brand. Okay. How do you know that it is really a true copy that you have to do a bioequivalent study that is a regulatory requirement that means, you have to do relative bioavailability bioavailability of the innovator brand and compare it with the bioavailability of this new proposed generic product and see whether it is how close it is 
whether there is absence of significant difference. And regulation says 80 percent to 125 percent if it allow it is al with the allowable limit. That means, if the reference product is considered to be 100 percent then compared to that if your drug is 20 percent less or it is 25 percent more by available then it will be allowed to come in the market. That is a regulatory requirement for all generic products to come in the market they have to pass this test okay. that is the importance of a bioequivalence test. Now, why as medical students we are going to be doctors we need to understand this because many a times we would need to switch from a brand or maybe an originator brand because most of the time the originator brand is costly as compared to that a generic brand generic uh, molecule it is cheaper. So, if we want to shift to a generic we need to be assured that it is of good quality it is of having a bioequivalence it is a bioequivalent product bioequivalent product the other name for bioequivalent product is it can be interchangeable it can be substituted with the for the originator brand. So, then why it is relevant why bioequivalence is relevant for us in pharmacotherapy one is generic drug licensing generic prescribing and generic substitution okay, when you are going to substitute a brand with a generic. So, unless I am confident that it is going to be a give a bioequivalence because only when it is bioequivalent we can expect a therapeutic equivalence. So, that is why it is relevant for our purpose. Now, let us try to understand this diagram. Now, this is also in fact again a basically it is the plotting of a uh, pharma the, the bioequivalent study. Now, at the bottom you find there are three curves that is three time concentration curve shown here and if I say these are three different formulations, but then the green is the innovator brand and all three are oral as we have stated up till now from the pattern of the curve you see that they are likely to be oral apart from oral they could also be say intramuscular, but let us assume for the timing that they are oral they definitely are not intravenous. And these two lines are actually representing the maximum tolerated concentration and the minimum effective concentration this window is called the therapeutic window. So, it appears that this drug particular drug we are considering it is the same drug the three formulations actually having same drug same strength okay, all are say 500 milligram of drug X. Okay. Now, this shows again the therapeutic window that it is a narrow therapeutic window drug that means, we would not like the drug concentration to lie above the maximum tolerated concentration or remain below the minimum effective concentration. Because in either case in the first case it will be there will be toxicity in the second case there will be no therapeutic benefit. So, we want the drug to remain within the window as much as possible. Now, this green drug is the innovator brand and the red and the blue are the two generic products which is compared compared with the green and what we find what do you find here that the green remains from this point of time that is say 1 hour to this point of time that is say 9 hour almost 9 hour it is in the therapeutic window within the therapeutic window. So, for almost 8 hours it remain within the therapeutic window. When you talk of the red one the generic one generic you find from say uh, half an hour to say 3 hour only from half an hour to 3 hour 2 and half hours it, it is above the therapeutic window only during this period may be 15 minutes and this period from 2 and half hours to say 7 hours to 7 hours yes 5 hours almost 5 hours it is within the therapeutic range, but for some time for uh, almost 2 hours 
it was above the therapeutic window that means it was in the toxic concentration or maximum tolerated beyond the maximum tolerated concentration okay and then from this point of time the later part it is below the concentration the third one that the blue one the generic 2 here you see it has never been able to reach out to the th to be within the therapeutic window now if you are asked to compare these three now these two generics are being tried whether they can be licensed now from the very appearance it is clear that although when you when you compare their extent of bioavailability that is AUC if you compare the AUC calculate the AVC they are more or less same if you calculate this area versus this area versus this area they may be same but when you talk of when you look at this pattern look at the C max look at the T max and look at the period during which they are remaining within the window definitely the red or the blue are unacceptable. Okay. So, that is the reason why there is a need to do the relative bioavailability study or the bioequivalent study in order to compare the bioavailability of different products or the different formulations okay, and particularly comparing the proposed generic formulation with a innovator brand. For licensing decision in order to whether or not they can be allowed to come in the market also sometimes for uh, assessing the quality of the product and and for deciding whether I will be prescribing this particular generic or not. So, to summarize we have discussed why we need to understand about bioavailability why as medical students and would be doctors we need to understand bioavailability because it is an important concept that actually aligns or that actually connects all the pharmacokinetic processes starting from absorption to distribution to metabolism or uh, biotransformation and excretion and also it tends to connect with pharmacodynamic and pharmacotherapeutic uh, activities or pharmacotherapeutic effects. So, knowing about bioavailability is important in order to prescribe medicines better. We have defined what bioavailability is and in the last slide at least we have also tried to emphasize why it is not just the extent, but the rate to which the drug following its administration reaches the systemic circulation is to be considered in bioavailability. So, bioavailability is defined as the extent and rate to which drugs following its administration reaches the systemic circulation and therefore, can cause its therapeutic effects. We have also discussed about absolute and relative bioavailability. When you talk of absolute bioavailability, we are actually comparing the non intravenous administration of drug and what is the bioavailability with that. And we compare that with the 100 percent bioavailability of intravenous administration and that is what is absolute bioavailability and which is expressed as F and uh, which is actually expressed in terms of percentage of the uh, if the bioavailability with intravenous is 100 percent compared to that what, uh, what percentage of bioavailability happens in case of non intravenous or oral administration. We have also spoken about the different factors that influence bioavailability and uh, the of the different factors it is the drug factor, it is the patient factor and also the contextual factors that we discussed. We discussed about how to measure bioavailability and we have mentioned that the most reliable measure of bioavailability is area under the time concentration curve, but then when you talk of relative bioavailability when you are comparing the same dosage form of different formulations. Okay. Then it is also the rate that becomes important the rate at which the drug reaches the circulation and the target site. And uh, we have also discussed that bioequivalence is actually an extension of the concept of bioavailability and it is actually a relative bioavailability concept. And why it is important to do a bioequivalence study particularly for regulatory decision making whether a generic product should be allowed to come in the market. But besides that in order to 
have confidence in the generic products quality, we need to possibly also do uh, by equivalent study in the academic setting. So, I think that is all for today and uh, thank you very much.